This week, Paul and I interview April Wright, hacker, author, teacher, and InfoSec community leader. In the news, an iOS flaw in Safari leads to trivial denial of service via CSS. Global warming impacts cl uh, cloud computing for a second time, and data breaches are shown to have long-term effects on stock prices. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. Layered Insight is the industry's first embedded security approach for containers. Trusted by Global 1000 Enterprises to secure their containerized applications, it's the only solution that requires no root privileges, has zero dependency on the underlying infrastructure, and is fully portable across any container environment. Unify DevOps and SecOps, enabling the rapid development of containerized applications without worrying about security. To learn more, please visit layeredinsight.com forward slash ASW. Rapid7 powers the practice of SecOps. Using shared data, analytics, and automated workflows, SecOps unites IT, DevOps, and security teams to make security an outcome of innovation. Rapid7 combines technology, expertise, and advocacy to drive vulnerability management, application security, incident detection, and log management for more than 7,000 organizations worldwide. Power up your SecOps practice with a free trial at rapid7.com forward slash security weekly. Welcome, everyone, to episode 32, our 33rd episode of Application Security Weekly. I am, of course, your host, Keith Hoodlett, and I'm excited to be joined once again by my illustrious co-host, Paul Asadorian. Hey, how's it going, Keith? Dude, it's going great. Uh, you know, it looks like fall is starting to set in here. I'm uh, pretty pretty well on my way to finishing some slides that I've put together for a couple talks in October, so life is good. What about you? How's things? You know, it's interesting as we talk about talks, Keith, and I just, while the show was starting, I was just reading a tweet about threat hunting, and I'm going to talk about that in my DerbyCon talk, and I remembered working at university, and I used a tool called IP Audit, and then I published an article, it's a security focus, I think before Symantec bought them, but the article still lives, right? And when I read it, I'm like, holy crap, that's like threat hunting, <laughs> and it was published in 2005, <laughs> so... I was like, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool to threat hunting. Yeah. So I'm Paul having Asadori. fun researching my DerbyCon talk as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. One quick announcement. Check out our on-demand material. Some of our previously recorded webcasts are now available on demand at securityweekly.com slash on demand. So go check it out. We got some stuff by Endgame, Logarithm. I think Black Hills is in there too. Uh, so John Strand and the team over there is pretty awesome. And you should definitely go check that out. Uh, with that, I am very happy to join, or to rather to welcome, uh, April Wright, the Preventative Security Specialist at ArchitectSecurity.org. April has a history of, uh, you know, lots of stuff basically that she's done in the community, including speaking at Black Hat, DEF CON, Derby CON, Hack in Paris, DEF CAMP Romania, IT Web South Africa, and a number of other conferences as well, including, I believe, DEF CON Group's core team uh, and went to DEF CON China recently. And also, by the way, uh, founded DC 617, of which uh, I helped to give some space to uh, when they got off the ground. So with that being said, of course, again, an awesome author, hacker, teacher, and community-involved uh, individual slash leader. April, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Awesome. It's nice to have awesome. you here in so, studio, too. Thanks for making the trek down. It's awesome. I'm I'm glad to have a car that I can drive here in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially like when when so many of us. Well, I, I live remote, right? So I kind of have to have a car, but because I don't really go anywhere in it, it's like, oh yeah, is the car gonna get me there this week? Maybe. <laughs> um, the last time I drove, I got part. a flat tire with a hole like the size of that you can put like your fist in it, and um, oh. so I I didn't drive after that. I'm like Massachusetts roads are the worst. So now I have like an SUV with. Like until really you get to rhode eyes. island then they're the second worst sure. I think. <laughs> there you go there you go um so april you've been doing uh you know a lot lately um before we jump into talking a little bit about sdlc and the book you recently released with o'reilly um what have you been up to lately and where can people find you next after they uh, you know get a chance to sit here and listen to you today 
So I've been doing uh, security awareness train the trainer program. So um, at Black Hat, I did a train the trainer program about how to build an effective security awareness program rather than just your once yearly click through it as fast as possible kind of computer based training. So this is more about throughout the year how you um, how you actually get people involved in uh, security awareness, how you make people care, which is the hardest part, how you break all the bad habits. Um, I gave it a black hat with Jason Street. Um, we're doing it again at DerbyCon and then at uh, Texas Cyber Summit um, in San Antonio, and there's still seats available for that one. Awesome, awesome. Now, um, one of those things that I think you know all security professionals uh, have a hard time with is really getting people interested or involved. Are there any maybe just you know again don't want to give away the whole farm here with the training that that you're actively giving, but um, are there any tips that stick out to you as you know simple things? Is it you know don't make them click through, make them in person? Are there high level things that people can be doing um, to get the word out there a little bit easier inside of their organization? Yes, um, make it relevant to them. Uh, people care about things that affect them. If it, if it doesn't affect me, why would I care? So if you can make it so that it relates to their life, if you can trick them into thinking it's really about protecting their teenagers when they can also use the advice, um, it's, it's all useful. So keeping them engaged by making it uh, relevant to their interests, their lives, their needs. When they see their phone connecting to your Hack5 Pineapple, um, that's personal. That's a, that's, they are going to think about that more than just a presentation about how people connect to Pineapples. You know, it's interesting. I was doing an a interview with um, an IT uh, YouTube channel. This guy, Zach, he's actually coming on Secure Digital Life. And he was asking me like like tips I have for people that um, are coming to work in security or whatever. And it's exactly what you're saying, April, is is my like one like really easy, stupid, simple tip because I read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? And the the one thing that I remember, I got to go back and reread it, reread it because there's a lot more in there. But the one thing was every time I uh, construct an outbound communication is I make it about them and I try and relate it to the person I'm sending it to. And so often... I get email and communications and I can see this happening in SDLC, right? Like you must do this and run this software and find all the bugs in your code, but you get such a better response when you make it about them and not about you. And so that was, that was good advice. I like it. I would also say that um, by gamifying it as much as possible, uh, that also really helps. So if you have a, let's say quarterly, uh, giveaway for a gift card or uh, money is always good. Everybody loves money. Um, and then for every time mm. some, mm. <laughs> most people love money. Most people, most people most need people. money. Let's put it that way. I like so, money. Do you like money? I like money. We should hang out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you get that movie reference. See, she does. April gets all of my jokes. The people that work here at security weekly are, are awesome, but they often, maybe I'm just not funny. It could also be part of it. That's definitely part of it. And they don't get a lot of my, my movie references. So if you don't want to end up on Monday Night Rehabilitation, then <laughs> <laughs> then you have like a, a giveaway or something at the end of the quarter and everybody that submits like a phishing email to, uh, to the SOC um, or whoever they're supposed to report it to, they get a point. If they escort somebody who is in the building without a badge to security, they get 10 points. So you, you, you create like a... a a point system and you let everybody know about it and then as they do their jobs they will think hey if i do the right thing i could be rewarded it's like pavlov's dog but without the bell with money <laughs> yeah <laughs> which could, it's all about rewards it can exactly. work with your kids too i've tried several programs like that with my kids mostly <laughs> My kids being hackers, they just try and cheat the system. And if I have it on a whiteboard, like when I'm not looking, my oldest son will go in there and change it. Or, you know, they always find ways to cheat, which is a lot of fun, actually. But it's okay if people are reporting phishing that isn't really phishing. Sure. I mean, as long as they're not really abusing the system. If yeah, they're, like if they're every like, email that comes in, they're just clicking right, the button right. to try and get but points. But that's why you make that worth like one point and other real valid things like escorting somebody or <laughs> reporting a vish or, mm -hmm. um, or, or reporting a spearfish even or something like that worth a lot more points. Do they lose a point if they report an email that was they thought was phishing but really wasn't? Do you deduct points? I that never, could be fun. I never thought of that. 
I don't know if every one, but like if you if you reach five, it, like maybe you lose a point. I would say no because um, then that discourages them from doing it. Yeah, and you no, right. you'd rather you want them to be your advocates. You want them to be working for you, and you want them to be doing it because um, it it reflects their interests. They like money. But now. <laughs> Uh, Jason Street, who you're teaching a, a class with, yeah. right, and you're very good friends with, um, he has kind of the opposite view when we were talking on Paul Security Weekly, and he was advocating for repercussions if you were the cause of, let's say, a major data breach. Um, well, it, yes and no. So you have to have a policy that talks about um, what happens if somebody falls for a real fish mm -hmm. or if somebody falls for a test fish. Um, and that the first couple of times you need to respond with training mm -hmm. because even if you brought in new people, even if let's say you fired that person, you fell for a fish, you're fired, you'd still have to train the next person. Sure. So you may as well train that, that person yeah. mm -hmm. and keep them. And if they keep falling for fishes and this is where you have to have the policy, five, five spearfishing clicks <laughs> and you're yeah. out, you know, like right. whatever the right. rule is, like you need to have that specified and make sure people know about it and all mm. the other policy type, type situations. But, um, yeah, training is the response first, and then you can have repercussions. I mean, yeah. training is a repercussion. It is, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, and it also, especially for, like, really high-risk individuals, like um, uh, executive admins, for mm. example, or sales, people that are opening a lot of attachments, dealing mm -hmm. with customers, they should also have role-based training about how to handle attachments. Do you have a VM that you open attachments in? Right, do you, right. How do you... How do you securely do things that relate to your job versus everybody getting here's what a fish is and mm. you know, whatever like having actual this is how somebody might attack you as a customer service rep phone representative mm -hmm. this is what they might do they might call five times in a row and try to get different information so um so the y you need to work closely with the the SOC and um incident response and things like that and try to figure out how attacks are happening um, and, and over time as you're doing training and you're doing programs to decrease that, then you can track metrics about how, um, how that's improved, how the incidents are decreasing, for example, as you're uh, building the program. And does that go for developers too? Same rewards and consequences type systems? Although if you're going to get rid of a developer after five bugs, you, you might not have developers pretty quickly. At least if I'm one of the developers, <laughs> I wouldn't last very long in that environment. <laughs> I, um, not, it, not exactly in the same way. Mm. So that's, that's bugs, not social engineering. Right. Or, that, or bugs or flaws. I mean, they're different. So, that, so when we're talking about social engineering, that's mm. a completely different category of vulnerabilities. That's the human element versus the code or architecture element. Yeah. And actually, uh, April, you just recently wrote a book on this, if I'm not mistaken, again, released by O'Reilly, uh, called Fixing an Insecure Software Development Lifecycle. Can you tell us more about it? First of all, like, you know, who the audience maybe is, because I'm sure some of our listeners will probably go pick it up. But then um, maybe talk us through a little bit of like some of the different things that you've included in the book uh, as useful things for managers or developers or security professionals to get them interested in this process. Yep. So uh, it's available on Safari Books Online. It is a short book. It's not a uh, full hundreds of pages. It's about a hundred pages. Oh, wait, um, is the electronic version free? No, you have to subscribe to. Oh, I haven't clicked start reading yet. <laughs> um, but it, uh, so you you can read it online, and it's um, it's aimed at anybody involved in the software development lifecycle. So anybody that uh, from from a, a project manager to a product manager to a security person who is tasked with. Uh, fixing a life or uh, coming into a life cycle that already exists. So software is being created. Let's say there's a startup. There's a process for creating software already. There's software out there, and then maybe they hire an official security team. So they bring in the security team, and the security team looks at the process. And the the, the book talks about how to. Uh, observe the process from start to finish, maybe once, maybe a couple times, uh, do a gap analysis, how to prioritize those gaps, how to present them to management with a business case and other types of uh, rationale, 
and then how to um, how to implement change. And that's probably one of the hardest things that we do uh, in security, I think, is implementing change because we have to get buy-in. We have to do it slowly um, because if we d make too much change all at once, then it causes problems and people push back and people actively work against us, <laughs> which happens all the time in security. So if we ease people into change, it talks about that. It's got sample checklists. It talks about how to um, how to provide uh, everything up front to people so that they're not surprised about what they have to do. Because if if you get all the way through the software lifecycle and you get from uh, design to uh, testing, and then it's about to go into production, and you say, oh, but we didn't do any security. That is not going to happen. That's going to drop off the table. So it's about how to get it in there before so that there's no surprises. Everybody knows what to expect. And and the product that comes out is more secure and preventing bugs rather than finding them later. Yeah, but can I so just apply security at the end with a WAF? Doesn't that? Yeah. Isn't that, <laughs> that's that totally works. So only if it's... Only if it's signal sciences, Paul. Yes, um. that, that's a next generation <laughs> WAF. Very big difference. I... We still need operational controls. We still need people that are doing defense and um, and threat hunting and these other things. But we, if we don't start with a strong foundation, mm. then their job may be impossible because we don't have the right logs coming out. Um, if we design software so that it's secure, then we can have the software actually contain attackers. We can have them move to, um, to other uh, types of like, uh, cyber deception type areas. We can do different things from the software perspective, but if we don't have logs, security logs coming out of the software, then there's n very little that the blue team can do. I have an interesting scenario that I want to run by you, April. We were actually talking about this on Paul's Security Weekly last week, and it was, if you do the threat modeling and you try and get ahead of it, like you're saying, as much as possible, right? And you develop the requirements, you do your threat modeling, and then... <laughs> You start handing it to Keith just dropped off. That was interesting. And then you start handing it to developers, right? You may have thought about security in the early in the process. However, it gets to the developers and they're like, all right, that's interesting with the requirements. Maybe they were in some of those meetings. You know what? To satisfy that requirement, I'm going to go get some open source library and I'm gonna, that's going to help me meet my requirement. Now, it, it granted, that could contain a vulnerability that we could find very easily early in the process. But what if it doesn't? What if it's an open source library that someone wrote about a year ago and unbeknownst to the software developer, the open source project maintainer goes, yeah, I'm all done with that. And it doesn't even make an announcement, like just stops updating it and stops accepting requests. Now you've got this open source library in your code and you're marching forward, incurring technical debt the further and further you go, because at some point you're going to find out that, holy crap, there's a ton of vulnerabilities in that library and they just recently came to light, and now we've missed that. That's a problem with anything in terms of documentation. Mm -hmm. And I, I have this book. It's the funniest thing. It's like four pages long. It's, uh, uh, I won't even say the organization it came out of. It's, it's about writing documentation for like Unix admins or something. <laughs> it's the shortest book ever. And we are so bad at writing documentation. But that's exactly why we need it. That's exactly why we need to have the information about what's in our products. And I think that's part of why, and I I know it's like a four letter word, but like GDPR is, a, a it, it does have some good elements because it makes us look at what we're doing. A lot of companies didn't know what data they had. They didn't know what they were protecting. They didn't know what their crown jewels were. So by making people actually consider what's in the software, what makes the software work, what data do we have, by, by requiring the company to consider those things, I think that's really important. And I don't think we do it enough. And that is a huge problem that we have these unmaintained software libraries. And I think that if we start using things like um, a style guide, mm -hmm. which uh, requires uh, developers to use certain libraries, for example, instead of getting their own. Yep. Um, I think that help. that is, uh, yeah, I think. But someone has to check in on that process, right? Whether it's in the style guide or it's not, like it, uh, it's to back up your point to say, like, you got to design it right from the beginning with security in mind that you have to take into account that scenario and go, when you do this, you will use this library. And by the way, there's a process in place that every three months or so, 
we go check on those libraries to make sure that no one's abandoned it, that it maybe doesn't have vulnerabilities, or if it did, that we update it and, you know, the whole thing. And that has to be in the process. There has to be some kind of check and balance for that specific scenario, which I believe so many organizations like Equifax completely left out of the equation. And I'm not picking on Equifax because they made mistakes that I've seen every single company, my own included, make over the years, right? Now, making them all in, in a row like that was the perfect storm. But again, don't be too hard on, you know, all companies make mistakes and don't make the right decisions when it comes to these things. But, you know, that's an example of the library issue that I, I, as we talk on this show, Keith, and it, it's been really apparent to me that that's a major problem, right? Because when we talk about Node.js, that has all those add-on packages. When we talk about developing browser extensions, those are really just more open source add-ons that are being dumped in. I mean, we've, how long have we talked about WordPress plugins, you know, being the same thing? And this could come back down to a Python library. Uh, I mean, we experienced it here with our own, you know, internal software. We're just, you know, developing, developing, but hey, When's the last time like we actually updated all of our libraries and we're like, oh man. And then when you update them, now you've got so much worse. So it's not even just security, it's technical debt in general that I think is a result of this problem. I think that DevOps automation <clears throat> can solve a little, maybe not solve a little bit of mm. that, but come into play. So let's say sure. that DevOps automation detects new libraries mm -hmm. that are being used. And then you can look into them, you can track them, you can add them to some kind of program sure um, that can help uh, you can also have a procedure or um, or uh, 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 procedure or uh, a process that support the policy of secure software and then um, that can say anytime you want to use a new library you have to get approval mm -hmm. and then that approval uh, includes adding it to some sort of list or database or spreadsheet or whatever maturity level you're at and then, um, so you can have checks and balances. You can have people say, well, you know, this hasn't been maintained in two years. Let's not use it. Find something else or write something. Mm. Um, that so could almost be a function of QA. Like, let the developer put it in, submit it to QA, and then QA does that discovery and says, well, you've got to go get back and get approval, or you have to do something if you really want to use this library. But you, you could, so you could feed into QA from DevOps automation, mm -hmm. where it's detecting new libraries that are in use, and then feeding that to QA saying, and then QA says, you know, well, we, this wasn't here before, why are we using it now? And then yep. you have justification, and... It's all about documentation, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I, I, I like that process a lot, actually. That's the best answer I've heard to that when I've put it out to people. So, I have a, a kind of a chicken and egg type question that I always go back to, especially as people are moving more toward DevOps and, and we get some pushback from development teams on documentation. Um, what is more important, coming up with the process in the form of documentation first or building the process in terms of practicing it to make sure that it works appropriately and then documenting what has worked? Like what, what have you found to be more successful in kind of your, your working with a number of different companies, April? So a lot of times when you have an informal process and you try to document it, you will see the problems in the process. I think that it, it is a chicken and egg scenario. So you have to be you have to do the process. Let's say you go through it once, and then you do um, you look back and and you say, okay, well, let let's document what we did, and let's see what worked and what didn't. And maybe that's once a quarter, maybe not every time, but um, but actually, when you diagram it out, when you write something on a whiteboard, you will see the problems that are happening. You will see where things are failing. You will see where the delays are. And then you can go back and fix them. If it's just an undocumented process, you may never discover those problems. That's a really good point. And um, that's something that I think uh, a lot of developers have a hard time grasping because, uh, you know, the code is documentation is kind of the way they like to think of it, going back to their agile methodologies. But um, maybe a, another good question as well as, so if you're well, a listener... On, I want to go back to that point. Is that really true? Because that, that's one concept that I, I learned when I was a full-time programmer, learning from more experienced programmers. And they said, if you, know, if you develop the, and I think it's the code complete from Microsoft Press also talks about this. Like if you write the most beautiful code ever, you don't need any comments or documentation because the code just documents itself. Have you ever gone back to code that you've written yeah. and tried, and even code that you wrote like six months ago and been like, what is this even Six do? months, I, I get in in the morning, I'm like, I wrote yeah. that yesterday? Like, yeah. Damn, what does that do? I, 
you have to have at least something that says what the function <coughs> does or what this is supposed to do because mm. if if um if you get hit by a bus or you know worst case scenario um i i, I hate to use the the negative things but let's say you go on vacation um <laughs> instead of getting hit by a bus wait Terrible you, you go on vacation and get hit by a bus <laughs> no oh <laughs> Instead of oh, getting hit by a bus. Yes, yes. oh, gotcha. So let's say the best case scenario, you go on vacation and another developer has to edit your code or the code. Um, and they go in and they're like, I don't know what this does. There's going to be that learning curve that you're going to be spending more time. And there's one thing that developers don't have enough of and that's time. So in, in my eyes as well, one of the things that a lot of people don't think about is there's ultimately going to be someone else that's not a developer that probably needs to under, understand the way the software works, right? Like, at the end of the day, if you get an API and it's not documented, nobody can use it except the developers that wrote the API. Um, so that's that's another important aspect of that. Now, if you're a listener, say you're a manager or even a, a maybe a development team, and you're interested in starting to get security, you know, integrated into part of the process, um, are, are there any maybe high level tips that you would want to share with the listeners in terms of you know ways that they could get started uh, either today or after a little bit of research? It's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I think that um, I think that a lot of times we understand some of the problems, and a lot of times we don't have any idea what the problems are. We just know that there are problems. We don't know what they are specifically. So, um, as with any change that you want to make, you start with observing. You sit back. You say, "I'm not going to make any changes. I just want to see what's happening." I just want to understand the process. And maybe you do it two, three, five, however many times it takes you, and you, you document the things that you notice. You document what's happening. You document uh, who's talking to who. You document who's approving things, what kind of meetings are happening. And then you start to have, you say, you know, this meeting happened, but nobody actually approved the architecture. Or this meeting happened, but, uh, or, or this, uh, the development started, but we, we weren't even finished with how the switch was going to be set up, and we didn't have enough ports and some other things. So, like, what are some of the things that you notice? So it's analysis at first before you make changes. And I think that's the key is that we, a lot of us want to go in and we want to say, okay, let's implement this and let's do this and let's add this and we're going to do code reviews and all these other things. But until you know how code reviews are going to help you and until you know um, that your problem is that you aren't doing code reviews, then implementing that and, and that, that gets back to metrics too, um, until you have a baseline of what your metrics are, how many of your bugs are security bugs? How many of your flaws, which are different from bugs, that I always try to talk about that, flaws are architecture and bugs are code to me. Um, so how many of your, uh, how many of those are uh, based on code versus uh, architecture? Who is uh, creating most of the security problems? Is it one person? Is it one team? Um, so having metrics and doing analysis before making any changes is the very first step you have to take. If you don't have any metrics to begin with, you're not going to know when you make progress. You're not going to be able to show that you're making progress. And when you do buy that code analysis tool and you do implement it, how are you going to show that it's making any difference? How are you going to justify that purchase and that time investment if you can't show that it's actually making a difference? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's one of those things where it's, you know, if you've bought it and you don't show any forward movement with it, then very, very quickly, it's like, okay, um, so so why do we buy this again? And it's not going to get renewed. And then suddenly, you know, you're now knee jerk reaction for, for the development teams. I was developing and I was using this tool and now we can't because it's no longer getting renewed, um, which builds uncertainty, which I think, you know, before the show, we were talking about how. Uh, uncertainty can be uh, interpreted as pain in the brain, as I think what you were sharing with us, April. So um, that was interesting as well. I know that we've we've got at least a few more minutes for this segment. Uh, Paul, did you have any other additional questions before I got to my special five questions for April? No, let's do the special five questions for April. Are they cool. tailored just for April, or are these the same five questions we ask everyone? So, so normally I ask more 
related uh, question, but uh, you know, from speaking with and knowing April, April works more on the process procedure side. So this is a little bit different. Uh, I'd say oh, it's, you do it's get special in questions. the vein of, wow, you yeah, so they're special, April. special for just April in this case. Um, so first of all, though, the, the first question is the same, which is what were the specs like on your first computer? Um, I think my first computer was, so I used an Apple II GS at school. Um, I, I, I feel like my first computer was a Commodore 64. We might've had something before that, but the first computer I remember was the Commodore There's no 64. way you're old enough for that. No yeah. way. I don't believe you. I am. I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm older than I don't. Look. No way. <laughs> what were you like? Just, early elementary school? We'll talk about it later. All right. <laughs> We won't disclose <laughs> such such things on air. Uh, so then, uh, let me also ask: What is your favorite editor for writing in? Since you know you've written a book, I'm, I'm sure you probably write a, a good amount of documentation as well. Um, when you sit down to write something, what editor do you end up in usually? Um, either Word or Google Docs. Um, it depends on. I have multiple computers and I travel a lot, so sometimes Google Docs is the best way to keep everything together. Um, but I also have Google Docs backed up to multiple computers, <laughs> and I have yeah. it in like other clouds too. That, and Google Docs is backed up to other clouds, so it's uh, redundant cloud backups for everything, including especially things I write. I lost a presentation once because of redundant cloud stuff, and never again. <laughs> yeah, wow. I was thinking that it was maybe like you overwrote an old version or a new version with an old version because of redundant cloud. I could see that being a version control problem, maybe. Something just um, com completely disappeared. It was just gone. Oh, wow. It like, happens. So it's like, yeah. there. I used to do all my presentations on a Mac with Keynote until I realized as you start updating Keynote, all of a sudden you can't open your older keynote files and that's when i decided on google slides because you can more easily share it i think is my my driver there uh-oh i'm gonna have to go back and do all my slides again now um <laughs> with that with that being said uh april what is your favorite technical book if you have one um i uh ooh, that's a good question um chris hadnagy's uh social engineering book is amazing it Create, it makes it the art into a science. Um, my, but uh, looking back, I learned Unix in detention by reading the Unix Sysadmin Handbook. It was this red book. Yeah, right. It's story. beautiful, it? beautiful. It has one paragraph on security. But I was in detention and I was on like IRC and I was doing like PPP account into a, um, a shell account. And Is that why you got detention? N no. <laughs> oh, okay. Just checking. <laughs> I, I got in trouble a lot with my parents about it because I was staying up late being on IRC. But right. Um. But so I read this Unix book. So wait, why were you in detention? I don't. Oh, even, we, you don't even remember. Like just. It could literally be anything. <laughs> it's probably probably for skipping class because I didn't really like to get a class. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, maybe as a, a secondary or follow-up question to that, then is what is your favorite non-technical book? Um, I really liked, uh, um, uh, I don't know exactly what it's called, like Water for Elephants. I thought that was good. Um, there was another one called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. And, um, Are these fiction or nonfiction? Oh, wait. Oh, did you say nonfiction? Non nonfiction. Non I said non-technical, so oh, it could non -technical. be either. Oh, non-technical. Yeah. Okay, case. well, that's fiction. Um... Because they sounded like fiction, which I don't is totally read it. fine. I, it's I don't just, really no, read no, that, anything. That's actually what I meant. Not, yeah. is, is honestly, it's, it's a book that you <laughs> oh, okay. enjoy reading yeah. as opposed to like a technical book, okay. which you generally don't enjoy reading. Marley and Me was awesome. I read it on a plane and I was like crying. You crying on oh the plane Oh my God, I was it. crying so much. It was so bad. Um, uh, not to give anything away, but <laughs> spoiler alert. <laughs> spoiler um, alert. Too late. <laughs> There's sad um, parts in that book. Yeah. Damn it. That's true. Oh, and uh, I and love, there's another one, uh, Douglas yeah. Copeland, Life After God. And it, like basically <clears throat> any of his books, Microsurfs, um, yeah, he's, he's amazing. Hmm. hmm, I'll have to check him out. And last question is, uh, who would you nominate for an interview or what topic should we cover on a future episode of Application Security Weekly? Is this like, uh, like the ice bucket challenge? <laughs> <laughs> yes, after that you have sure, to sort of, yeah. a bucket of ice water over your head after you recommend someone, yes. Um, oh, that's a good question. Uh, 
I would say uh, Johnny Christmas would be a great person to talk to. Yes. That would be a lot of fun. Yes. Has he been on I, the show? Uh, he oh. has not. Oh. I met him in person, actually. I think for the first time, which is weird, we ha- had that conversation. Like, I feel like we should have met before now, but I think this is the first time we've met in person. Kind of. So thing. he yeah. and I met at... Um, at a conference last year and uh we both bonded over the fact that we call ourselves recovering introverts um because we learned how to not be introverts anymore we were both like terrible at it at, and just you know never talked to anybody so we both overcame it and we became speakers and other things so um we totally bonded over the recovering introvert thing mm. so yeah he, he's a great guy and um yeah, yeah he's, he's awesome we can we can get him on the shows yeah. for sure good hack. definitely definitely Awesome. Well, uh, in the meantime, we're going to take a short break, a short break, excuse me, and then come back for the news.